Hi folks, hope you're doing well. This week we're going to be talking about media audiences and fandom. And just for reference there, that is, I photoshopped Claude Levi Strauss holding Baby Yoda. Had him included in some slides that I ended up deleting to keep this a little bit tighter and more streamlined. But I just wanted you to see him. You're welcome. Okay, just as I've been doing each week, I'm going to kind of give you a preview of what's happening between April 6th and April 12th. So we're going to be watching a film this week, reading Henry Jenkins, and then reading uh, Sarah Jones' The Sex Lives of Cult Television Characters. If you haven't done your weekly reading notes assignments, all eight of them that you're required to do since we've updated the syllabus given the COVID situation, please do that and upload those by Sunday, um, again, April 12th. If you are Mark, Delian, or Juno, you'll be uploading again by Sunday, April 12th, your discussion leader supplements. And those can take a bunch of different forms. It could be a visual, you could create a PowerPoint. That's what most people have been doing. I think that's the, the, the easiest structure to be able to get back out to you. It could be a handout. Um, you're not limited to those choices, but uh, remember all of those things, whether weekly reading notes or your discussion leader supplements, if you're one of the people who were, you know, your names are there and you have a giant arrow next to it, uh, get that stuff to me by April 12th. Okay, so as you saw in the last slide, we're going to be watching a film this week together. So you're going to be watching the 2010 documentary, The People vs. George Lucas. I think it's especially worth thinking through this film in light of the polarized fan reactions to the most recent Star Wars trilogy that were released between 2015 and 2019. Also, this slide is an excuse to include a bunch of weird Anakin face memes. And also, also, you could probably use something to watch to pass the time as you are trapped in your home. Okay, so a bit of history. 1993 is when fandom studies emerges into a right proper field of study and is treated as an, a legitimate object of study within the academy, and it's because of the publication of three books. There's Enterprising Women by Camille Bacon Smith. There's Textual Poachers by Henry Jenkins, which we've talked about Jenkins' book a little bit before. And then there's finally Lisa A. Lewis's edited collection, uh, Adoring Audiences. Now, I'll go into more detail in a bit about each of these works, but for now, I'll just say that they establish the study of fandom and participatory culture as a legitimate field of study. They take seriously the relationship that individuals represented here by Human Fall Flat on the left have with mass media content and popular culture. Uh, they think about how it shapes identity and community and self-expression and power and so on. And this is, they treat it as something that's vital and worthy of our consideration. They tried to imagine media audiences not just as consumers, but as creators in their own rights, as producers. So there's a bunch of different places you could start tracing the history of fandom studies. And I want to, at least for this slideshow here, start with um, an argument about meaning. Not so much what meaning is or why it matters, but where it's located. So some schools of thought when thinking about texts, uh, here I've just chosen a novel, Harry Potter, as a kind of thing that we could think through visually, right? Where is meaning located in, in this story, Harry Potter? Is it completely and utterly buried within that text and it's the reader's job to dig it out, so to speak? So meaning is objectively there within the texts and it's generally unified, meaning that if you read that text and I read the text, we'll arrive more or less independently at kind of the same meaning. Um, is meaning that's therefore something completely produced by a singular author figure? Is the author's will uh, what determining is what the determining factor for meaning is? Or other scholars have asked, uh, does meaning exist outside of the text? Meaning isn't really locked up in the text, they might argue, but rather it's dynamic and emergent. It's not fixed. It's produced between the reader and the text. It exists in that space between those two uh, individuals. So let me give you a bit of background on this and how it led to the foundations that gave rise to those three books that I told you about, Enterprising Women, Textual Poachers, and Adoring Audience. Okay, so here we're being revisited by our friend Roland Bart, who we've met throughout the semester, um, primarily in relation to his text Mythologies when we were talking about popular consciousness and ideology. But Mythologies was published in 57 and translated into English in 72. Then we get the pleasure of text in 73, and then image music and text in 77. It was a collection of 13 essays that were published between 61 and 73. And the most famous, or at least the most thought about or cited, is probably Death of an Author, which was written in 1967. And let me tell you a little bit about that particular essay. So 
in it, Bart argues that meaning of a text isn't solely under the control of an author figure, but rather that meaning is produced between the reader and the text. The text exists in dialogue, and when I say dialogue, I'm kind of borrowing from the the language and also the ideas of Mikhail Bakhtin, who's one of my sort of favorite scholars who you have probably heard me talk about throughout the semester. Um, so in dialogue with the reader and the historical and cultural context in which a text is produced and in which it exists, any text, Bart argues, is a tissue of quotations, and that itself is a quotation from Bart. In other words, every single text exists. Again, here Bart is drawing on uh, or at the very least thinking of the same on the same wavelength as the work of Bakhtin, that texts, and when we say text, we mean something that's woven together, like a text from textile, every film or video game or every single human utterance, it exists not in a vacuum, isolated and detached from all things, but rather it, it exists in relation to or anticipates uh, other speaking subjects or other sort of texts. It exists in dialogue with all other instances of communication. In other words, no text is an island. So this brings us to consider Stuart Hall. Um, in particular, his article Encoding and Decoding in the Television Discourse, which was published in 73. He argues that texts aren't fixed, nor is meaning. It's not predetermined, but rather texts are a product. It's a social product and a phenomenon. So texts, as a result, have a life cycle. They are produced, they circulate, they're consumed and reproduced. Hall also puts forward a theory of reception in which he suggests that text can be interpreted in basically three ways. There's the dominant or preferred reading, there's an oppositional reading, and there's a negotiated reading of a text that exists sort of between those two poles of dominant and oppositional. We've already talked about this in class. So uh, check your notes, or at the very least, uh, Google around uh, with Stuart Hall and encoding and decoding. It's really, really interesting. Next up, we have Janice Radway. She is the Walter Dill Scott Professor of Communication Studies and a Professor of American Studies and Gender Studies at Northwestern. Her book, Reading the Romance, which was published in 84, examines reading as both an individual and communal practice by exploring the ways in which readers of popular romance fiction, uh, the vast majority of whom were, at least at the time of Radway's study, women, engaged with and interpreted and built relationships with these stories and these kinds of genres. Uh, again, viewing reading as a social phenomenon rather than detaching texts from actual lived social reality. Then we have John Fisk. He's a professor emeritus of communication arts at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. I have a few books over there to the right. Uh, he wrote more, but these are the books that I wanted to highlight. Television Culture, which was published in 87, Reading the Popular in 89, and Understanding Popular Culture, also in 89. So following on the, the work of David Morley and Stuart Hall and others, Fisk argues that media audiences aren't inherently coherent, right? All audiences aren't the same through and through. There's diversity within there, right? There's variation. They aren't blind. They're not sort of passive zombies who mindlessly consume anything that media producers throw their way. Instead, audiences have more agency and power than scholars had been thinking, or at least that was his argument, right? particularly those kinds of scholars who had been operating under the Frankfurt School mode of thought. Um, that's me painting with a broad brush, but for this narrative of the history of fandom studies, I think that works for right now. So he also argues that audiences and not industries create popular culture, not the other way around, or at least not entirely. Then we have Constance Penley. Um, she is a professor of film and media studies and a co-director of the Carrie Valsey Wolf Center for Film, Television, and New Media at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, her Twitter profile was a little bit too on the nose. I just thought we had to show it. She wrote a number of articles prior to 1993, as well as a book entitled NASA Slash Trek. It was published in 1997. Both those articles and that book uh, explore the ways in which media audiences reimagine and augment and supplement and just rewrite popular entertainment, in particular focusing on what is called slash fiction, Slash fiction, if you've never heard of it, is a subgenre of fan fiction that explores romantic and sexual relationships between same-sex characters. Oftentimes those characters are fictional, but they could also be actors or historical or public figures. But typically it's fictional characters or actors. All right, so now we've sort of circled back. These are some of the things that led into the development of those 1993 texts. So now let me talk about those. So Camille Bacon-Smith is a folklorist and an author of several works of fiction. Her book, Enterprising Women, 
uses long-term ethnographic research to understand the daily lives and experiences of fan fiction writing communities, particularly those that are, as the disturbingly orange cover here may suggest, are focusing on Star Trek. The thing about this text, if you read these three of the Holy Trinity that were published in 93, this is clearly the most ethnographic. It produces what Clifford Geertz called thick descriptions. She goes to conventions and she hangs out with people for a very long time and participates in their daily lives and studies that to create really vivid, rich textured descriptions of what it's like to be uh, within this community. This brings us to Henry Jenkins, who we met in the last video lecture and who we've kind of been talking about throughout the semester. He's come up multiple times. He's probably the most well-known scholar of fandom and fan culture and participatory culture. His book, Textual Poachers, draws on Michel de Certeau's concept of textual poaching, from which the title derives. Um, textual poaching is when an individual plucks elements, so think a character or a world or concepts or things, whatever you want to call it, from publicly circulating mass media texts and then recombines them or rewrites them, uses those elements to create something new so a fan could create their own character that exists within the world of Star Trek or within the world of Star Wars, right? You can imagine lightsabers existing in your, your own sort of narrative that you spin yourself. You could create your own Jedi, right? So focusing on audiences as producers, that's what his book's doing, and not just as consumers. Then we have Lisa Lewis's edited collection, Adoring Audience. I couldn't find an image of Lisa Lewis anywhere online, so I have instead included this image, which sadly I did not Photoshop myself, of Yoda. Um, it looks like Yoda about to sneeze or coughing, but in any case, it is the pinnacle of human culture, in my opinion. So let me highlight just one essay from the collection, uh, Adoring Audience. It's actually Lewis's own, entitled Fandom as Pathology. In that article, she argues that fans, which she reminds us is, is short for fanatic, they were viewed in a kind of, they were, they were stigmatized. They were treated as obsessed individuals who were hysterical and overly attached to mass media text, who were sort of unwitting victims of consumer culture. And she argues that this us versus them, if you want to call it fans versus the quote unquote normals, for lack of a better word, um, and the stigmatization of those individuals who were fans was a manifestation of larger, broader social anxieties about unchecked consumerism and mass society. I would say that in the 21st century, fandom and fan culture is a lot more commonplace than it uh, once was. I think most individuals, if you ask them, are you a fan of anything, they would be able to provide you with an answer that I'm a fan of X, Y, Z, you know, many, many different things. Uh, it's less stigmatized than it once was. When I was growing up, I was born in 86, so in the 90s when I was playing with X-Men and playing video games, those things were oftentimes uh, looked down upon, and you'd be ostracized for liking these things. Whereas today, saying that you went to watch um, a movie involving Groot and Rocket Raccoon is commonplace. Of course you want to see that. It's one of the biggest film franchises of all time. Why wouldn't you go watch movies produced by the MCU? So it's, it's interesting to see the, uh, this document as a historical... But, but both as a historical document, but also as a really interesting theoretical foundation for thinking about fandom and how we've perceived fandom over, the, over time. Okay, just a few more things. We're nearly done with this whole walk through the history. Again, it's an incomplete history of the study of fan culture, but a history that we've been doing here. I just want to mention a few things about the structure and infrastructure of the study of fan culture. So the PCA, the Pop Culture Association, was founded in 1970 by Ray Brown at BGSU in Bowling Green, Ohio. We've talked about that in class previously. The other two things that are listed on this page are really, really important and I think shows how the discipline of fan studies research is kind of coming together. In 2012, the Fan Studies Network, uh, a conference, there was one previously just in uh, in Europe, in the UK, if I'm not mistaken. I've never gotten to go, unfortunately. And now there's one in, in the United States. That was founded in 2012, the same year the Journal of Fandom Studies was likewise founded. Now, if you are interested, if you find yourself interested in, in studying this sort of stuff, participatory culture, I would start with these two books. Um, Understanding Fandom and then Fandom Identities and Communities in a Mediated World. Both of these are great texts. The one on the left will probably be a good uh, entryway into the field of study. I would also hit those three kind of pillars, 1993 texts. All right, so to wrap up, I want to make this a little bit more concrete. And I'm going to do this by showing a few images from my own research on fan and maker communities 
and Atlanta, Georgia. So I'm going to show you a few images from the last few years of field work that I've been conducting. These are cosplayers. Now, if you've never heard of the term cosplay, it's a portmanteau of the word costume and play or role play. And it's when individuals dress up in costumes. And uh, most of the times these are, these are handcrafted. Uh, sometimes people buy parts and bring them together as an assemblage. But the idea is that you're generally speaking going to be seeing people in custom made garments and accessories and props and all that sort of stuff. The idea is there's a kind of culture of one-upsmanship. Individuals will come, you'll get into the community, you'll build a costume. And then oftentimes it's a kind of one-upsmanship with the self as well as others within the community to build bigger and sexier and flashier and incorporate new technologies and gimmicks or anything into that costume to produce the most latest recent superhero film, uh, a comic that's exactly accurate to it, or to create something that's new, unique and interesting, right? So one of the reasons I'm showing you these images is to, to demonstrate the ways in which texts matter to people, so much so that they're not just watching a film or playing a video game and consuming it as mindless entertainment. Instead, it's something that kind of seeps into the fabric of who we are. When you go to a convention and you sit down with an individual, they've spent hours and hours and hours, sometimes hundreds of hours, if not years, building a costume and hundreds, if not thousands of dollars fabricating these things. And if you ask individuals in the community, like the friends and, and people who I've become uh, good friends with and who've been my research informants, why do you do this? What drew you to this character or that character? Or why do you like, you know, whatever text that we're talking about? It's not just to pass the time, right? It's, it's something that really means something to them. Uh, these characters shape their identity. It helps them. It's a tool for self-expression. It's equipment for living. It helps them get through difficult situations. I think you at home right now, um, dealing with a ginormous pandemic that's reshaped and disrupted daily life for basically everyone on the planet, you're probably finding yourself needing something to comfort yourself. And oftentimes it's it's text, rewatching Star Wars. I just recently rewatched the Marvel Cinematic Films just because there's a kind of comfort there. And being able to attach yourself to these characters and see them succeed, it helps, right? It's, it's more than just media, right? When you're looking at cosplayers, they're spending hours and hours and hours learning new techniques working with new materials, exploring new technologies, uh, building a business around their hobby, expressing themselves in interesting ways. So cosplay is one of many, many, many things that are uh, under the sort of rubric of fandom studies. That's just one aspect of fan culture that I myself study. So if you're interested in all this stuff, I, I definitely think you should check out those, those sort of pillar texts that I've mentioned throughout this. You've got a little intro into the history of fandom studies. There's a lot more in depth there. If you're interested, feel free to follow up with me and I can send some articles or books or anything. Uh, you can borrow them from my office whenever we're allowed to physically meet uh, in the real world. So last thing I wanna say before I post this online, in case you are terribly, terribly bored and you need something to watch, HBO, I believe as of April 3rd, if I'm not mistaken, is now free and accessible. So if you have some means to stream, you should theoretically have a whole bunch of content to, uh, to peruse if you didn't already have access to it. So take care and let me know if you need anything.